Hello, and welcome to Ryan and Brian's Bible Bistro, a podcast all about the Bible, theology, and all things related to the Christian faith. I'm the Ryan half of Ryan and Brian, and this is episode number 65. Today, Brian and I are welcoming Dr. Tremper Longman III to the podcast. Dr. Longman is the Distinguished Scholar and Professor Emeritus of Biblical Studies at Westmont College and is the author of numerous books. Dr. Longman recently published a book, Revelation Through Old Testament Eyes. Brian and I discuss with Dr. Longman the importance of the Old Testament for understanding the book of Revelation in its cultural context. This is a great conversation if you are interested in the book of Revelation. Before we get started, just a quick reminder that you can find us at thebiblebistro.com, on Instagram and Facebook at The Bible Bistro. You can watch us on YouTube as well at Ryan and Brian's Bible Bistro. If you are watching us there, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. The Bistro is a labor of love for Brian and I, but it does cost money for us to produce. So if you're enjoying the podcast, we have set up a Patreon account, which allows you to contribute financially to the podcast to help with our costs. If you become a monthly contributor, not only will you be helping us continue the podcast, but you can also get yourself some Bible Bistro swag, like a coffee cup or t-shirt. You can find a link to subscribe at the top of our website, thebiblebistro.com, and also in the show notes. We do appreciate your support. If you can't financially support us, you could also support the Bistro by simply sharing the podcast with others. All right, let's jump right into our conversation with Dr. Tremper Longman III, looking at Revelation through Old Testament eyes. Hey, Brian, welcome back to the Bistro. Hey, Ryan, how you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I got my coffee. I am got my oh, coffee, good. which, you know, this is like the default thing that I have to have <laughs> before we have any kind of conversation. Right. So you doing well? I'm doing okay. You know, the, my own, here's my only issue is I really have got to do some lawn work today. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, the the rain, season. and the rain is coming. So, yeah, it's one of those things you're like, oh, how do I fit, you know, mowing the lawn in with the rest of my life? But other than that, no, that's that, that's a very small problem compared to many others that are going on. So. Absolutely. Well, today is no a special deal. day in the bistro because it's not yeah. just you and I. Yes. Right. Why don't, Brian, why don't you introduce us to our guest that we have today? Well, I'm very thrilled, and I want to say thank you to Dr. Trimper Longman for uh, joining us today in the Bistro. We uh, asked him, and he was gracious enough to to join us. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the conversation today. Um, so thank you, Trimper, I'll say first of all. Uh, let me introduce you just briefly for those who, who don't know who um, who Trimper Longman is, but he's a, he's been a longtime scholar and professor of Old Testament who is now retired since 2017. And uh, you said you retired, Trimper, uh, in a message to me uh, in order to be closer to your grandchildren, right? And you've <laughs> right, moved. Right, yeah. <laughs> is, and, and so you, now we were just talking a little bit before, so you have is it correct? You have six granddaughters right now. Is that correct? Well, uh, six granddaughters, and as of last February, a grandson. So, okay. and, and then in the next couple of days, I was mentioning that my just got a message from my wife that uh, uh, my daughter-in-law uh, just went into labor with wow. our seventh granddaughter. I'm down in Florida, <laughs> where my mother is. Right. Uh, while right. they're up wow. there. So. <laughs> wow, seven. Seven granddaughters and a grandson. That's that's yeah, amazing. Yeah. But anyway, it's it's neat. And and you continue to write though. And you he, you know, uh, Tramper, you've written over twenty books on on various subjects. Yeah. But but the book that we wanted to talk to you about today, and the reason we've invited you here, is just last month. Uh, I, I is this? I guess it's your latest book. But just last month yeah. was published yeah. at least. Yeah. Uh, right. It's called the Revelation Through Old Testament Eyes. Yeah. And I, the title, of course, caught my name or caught my caught my eye. I should say the name of it. And I thought, you know, this is one I really want to look at and read and, and found it helpful. I found some of your other books helpful, which I'll, I'll mention later on. But that's really what we wanted to talk about. So let, let me ask you, first of all, what kind of led to your decision to write this book? And, and here's what I was predicting. And you, you even say in, in kind of part of the book and the acknowledgments, you know, you're an Old Testament scholar and, mm. you know, you, you said you took great pleasure in kind of saying, hey, I'm writing a book on the book of, or writing a, yeah, a book on the book of Revelation. And, and so what, what gave rise to that, would you say? Yeah. Yeah. So happy to, and I hope this doesn't shine badly on me to correct that it's now over 30 books. But, oh, well, uh, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, he needs no. that. He needs, <laughs> yeah. Brian needs to be corrected from time no, to time. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and you he, should count every, every one. Every yeah, one is exactly. a task. And, so. and a number of them are co-authored, I should say. So maybe it boils down okay. to a full town, full time <laughs> equivalency of 20. But, uh, <laughs> oh, God. but um, yeah, so, um, so Andy LePoe, who is mm -hmm. the general editor of the series for Kriegel, was uh, somebody I worked with when he was uh, editor at InterVarsity Press, with whom I published a number of books. Though he wasn't my primary editor, I think he was the boss of my primary editors. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, Andy, in his retirement, uh, put together this great idea for a series on... Um, you know, New Testament books through Old Testament eyes and to right. uh, recruit Old Testament scholars in the main uh, to, or people who are very uh, versed in the Old Testament to write on that aspect of the book. But probably because I'm old and maybe because I've written 30 books, Andy said, <laughs> I'm going to let you, I did Mark, but I'm going to let you choose the book you want to write because I haven't wow. uh, okay. assigned them yet. And I thought to myself, well, if I'm writing on the New Testament through Old Testament eyes, and I'll get back to why that's such an important idea. Right. But um, I said, well, you'll do either Matthew, Hebrews, or Revelation right. <laughs> because sure. they're so permeated with Old Testament right. ideas. Mm -hmm. And since I'd already worked a lot on the book of Daniel, Revelation became the mm -hmm. natural choice. So I asked right. him if I could write on Revelation, and he said so. And, and of course, the reason why um, this series as a whole is— uh, so relevant and important is to remind us just how integral the yeah. Old Testament is with the New Testament, with some quarters saying we need to separate ourselves or whatever, unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. It's kind of like, yeah, you can't do that. Right. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, if you want to understand the New Testament, you got to exactly. you got to understand the Old Testament. Right. And so uh, I was very happy to write this book. Right. Yeah. I'd... Yeah. I appreciate that. I, uh, you know, I've taught the book of Revelation. I, I was a New Testament professor. Was my yeah, was my right. career and and taught the book of Revelation uh, several times. And and that's I always I always kind of had the saying. Really, the book of Revelation is easy to understand. The only thing you have to do is understand the entire Old Testament perfectly. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and then you understand New Testament eschatology perfectly. Yeah, you yeah, put those okay. two together. Yeah. You understand it. No yeah, problem. Right, no, pro right, right. No, pr no problem. But, no problem. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but you're right. It's crucial. You know, Old Testament is crucial for understanding the book of Revelation. Well, I, I appreciate it. And the book's been fantastic. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So Brian and I both had a, a chance to read through it and you, you've got a lot of great examples in there, but can you maybe give our listeners a couple examples or one or two places in the book of Revelation where understanding it through Old Testament eyes is especially important in understanding it? Yeah. And and I I don't want to um, I I don't want to overplay my hand, but this is a book where where throughout the Old Testament is extremely important, and sure. uh, and the Old Testament itself uses a lot of ancient Near Eastern images right. to communicate its message, and of course there's also a Greco-Roman background to Revelation, right. but by way of example. Um, a particularly uh, interesting one is Revelation 19, 11 and following, um, where you get this description of um, where it says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like a blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. So mm. just in this paragraph, this description of Jesus, um, it's made up of a whole bunch of sort of micro quotations, well, allusions right. back to right. Psalms, to Ezekiel, to Isaiah, even this with justice, he judges. That's from Psalm 98. Hmm. And... Um, right. And then it goes on to describe the armies of heaven were following him. 
riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean, coming out of his mouth as a sharp sword with which to strike right. down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. Mm. Psalm, two. Psalm 2. He treads the yeah. wine press and the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And and on and on. I mean, it's just right. dripping with yeah. Old Testament allusions, which then you realize what's going on is that the picture of God as a warrior in the Old Testament is being is culminating in Jesus appearing at the final judgment. Okay. That there is this uh, anticipation in the Old Testament that God is going to come back and save his people and judge their oppressors. Um, and right. we today are living in this period between the Old Testament and the second coming, which is a time of spiritual warfare, you know, right. where mm -hmm. our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against, you know, spiritual powers and authority. And, right. uh, and what Revelation and other apocalyptic portions of the New Testament uh, are telling us is that um, that God is going to come again in the future and judge all spiritual and human mm -hmm. evil. Right. Save this people. Good. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. The uh, and and it is interesting to me. The thing that's interesting you mentioned allusions. It, it, it's not yeah. often quotations. Right. It's often right. these. Right. Just these snippets. How much? And this is this is kind of uh, this just occurred to me as you were talking. How much of that do you think people picked up on in terms of the whole story? Yeah. Uh, the original readers is who I'm thinking of here, yeah. or the the early readers um, or hearers. Do you yeah. do you think they would have picked up on on the connections? Balaam, for example, and, yeah. and yeah. Uh, you know the, the what you mentioned there with Psalm two and. Yeah, uh, I, you know, uh, it's always hypothetical to sure. ask how much. I think that the author of Revelation expected them to pick up on right. it. You know, an, <laughs> an ideal an ideal reader would have picked up on it. But it's good point. Good point. But yeah. um, and 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 it's like today. Um, uh, and and I would also say that I. I think that the well, actually, I think I feel fairly confident saying that Bible literacy uh, among God's people at this time was much higher yeah. than it is today. Um, Agreed. It's yeah. kind of low right now because um, everybody has a Bible, but studies have shown yeah. that Christians aren't reading and studying their Bible right. as uh, I think and they right. should. <laughs> Right. And uh, me too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in the Psalms, you know, it's in, you're, you had a whole section on the on the use of the Psalms in, in Revelation. And and those are, of course, would have been sung in, in the corporate worship yeah, of, right. of the people of God. And, right. and you know, right. these would in the same way with us, maybe hymns will be something yeah. that we can remember more than the scripture and that kind of thing. I, I think that that is something. But yeah, these other images, it, it, it's just an interesting question. It just occurred yeah, to me. Yeah, as you were, no, it's a good question. It's a good it. question. Right. When you're preparing for this book, or as you studied and as you did research in this book, was there anything that you found that was, I don't want to say, I don't even know if I want to say new to you, but it, but surprising to you or that you, you looked at in a different way because of the research you did for this book? Um, yeah, I, in a sense, I don't think anything dramatic because I thought about it a lot right. over the years and kind of sure. knew where I would be um uh, where where what i would encounter uh except that i would say in terms of the depth and pervasiveness mm, of the right. old testament background i think also you know i i uh probably also and this may be in the light of current situation where revelation is used for future oriented only kind right. of anticipation or to fuel a kind of right. culture war i think it right. became abundantly clear to me that that's not what the book of revelations all about <laughs> um and right. so so yeah so and i'm sure there were a number of things along the way that I had just hadn't thought about before. <laughs> right. I saw. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I want to ask you a little bit later about that. Um, you know, how do we understand it and why you think, you know, it's understood in, in so many different ways. Yeah. 
if you were going to describe the book of Revelation to someone, let's say someone who was maybe had a passing familiarity with it, but like you said, maybe one of these Christians who's yeah. not necessarily biblically literate today, in simple terms, how would you describe the message of the book of Revelation? Yeah, absolutely. It is um, the message of the book of Revelation to his contemporary audience in a way that's relevant to following audiences, including ours, is to say, um, the world looks like it's falling. The world looks like it's falling apart and out of control, and that right. evil is in control. But the truth is, God is in control, and He will have the final victory. And right. so, the purpose of Revelation, and this is true, the purpose of Daniel too, and of apocalyptic right. literature in general, yep. is to uh, bring comfort to God's people who are in difficult situations, which is interesting because that's kind of the reverse of, say, a prophet like Jeremiah or Ezekiel. They're, right. God is using <laughs> them to make the comfortable uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Yeah, right. So, whereas Revelation right. and Daniel are writing to God's people to make the uncomfortable comfortable that and assure right. them. And then with the... With the uh, further admonition, because of that, stay faithful. Stay right. faithful in the midst of of these yeah. challenges to your faith. Yeah, that's very, it's very interesting. And yeah, as you were describing the message, I was thinking, yeah, that, you know, apocalyptic in general, like you said, your connection to Daniel and, and thinking through those kind of things. Mm. Why do you think, and I guess in some ways that you've, you've answered this in terms of people just not thinking about the Bible in a, in a, um, complex way anyway, or yeah. know, complex isn't the word I'm looking for, but you know what I'm saying, in a, yeah. in a deep way. Why do you think there's so many, why, why do you think it's such a temptation for people? And I'm sure you get this when, when you yeah. told somebody you're, oh, I'm writing a book, writing a book on Revelation. Oh, what's, you yeah. know, what are the signs? Yeah, like, yeah. Don't you think this is right. a sign? Apache right. helicopters. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> which, you, yeah, which you mentioned yeah. specifically, but why, why do you think, why do you think there's such a temptation for us to look for some kind of esoteric or hidden or, you know, secret meaning, or, you know, there's some kind of key to decoding this that's going to, that's going to give us some kind of secret knowledge. What, what do you think is the temptation there? There, there might be more than one reason, but one thing sure. that I think allows for it is the fact that, you know, it is kind of, particularly if we don't know our Old Testament well, or even right. if we do, I mean, the Old Testament imagery strikes us as really strange. Um, weird. Yeah. Weird and hard to understand without study. And that allows some interpreters to exploit that problem mm. and to talk about secret messages or whatever. Um, yeah, they don't understand that the signs of the time are not things that are going to happen within a few years of the second right. coming, but rather they're signs of the time uh, that occur all the way throughout time until Christ comes right. again. And so, right in this, yeah. in this age, we find ourselves in. Now. Right. Yeah. Right. So every age yeah. rightly says, Hey, this is describing my age. Yes, it does. It doesn't mean Jesus <laughs> is coming back <laughs> in right. two years, but it means, uh, right. So, you know, I became a Christian in high school, senior year of high school, when somebody gave me the late great planet Earth, you know, how really, yeah. So, <laughs> how Lindsay, I read it, and, and uh, and you know, how Lindsay talks about he says, yeah, I don't know that, when it's going to be exactly, but I can't imagine right. us getting beyond 1975, right? And uh, but you see, Lindsay got one thing right, and that is Christ is coming again, and he sure. is going to judge those uh, who are wicked. And I knew I was on the right, wrong side at that time. <laughs> mm, okay. But that doesn't justify these kind of... Um, right. Because I debated a guy named Harold Camping in 1994 yeah. <laughs> in front of a, like a thousand people. And behind the stage, I said to him, I said, you know, um, aren't you, isn't it a problem if you're wrong, that you're misleading people. And he said, well, not really, because because um, even if I'm wrong, people are thinking about becoming Christians. I'm going, no, that's not, even though that was my <laughs> situation, that a lot of people, a lot of my contemporaries became Christians 
because of Hal Lindsey back in the 70s. But then as right. time went on, they left the faith because they right. said, what's going on here? This person yeah. misled me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you can't trust this, then what, yeah. what can right. you trust about right. what Christians are saying about anything? Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. That's fascinating. I, yeah, I didn't know that. that you you'd uh, I didn't remember that. You'd... Uh, come to faith through Hal Lindsey. That's crazy. That's, yeah. that's an interesting story. Yeah. So. Yes. Sorry. I <laughs> forgot to plug oh, in fine. my computer. <laughs> oh, like, you're yeah. all right. Yeah. yeah that's that's, <laughs> better that's pl- important. Better so, plug it in. Yeah. yeah there you go. <laughs> Getting yes. the red. Then we'd, <laughs> then we'd have to ask questions about, well, was he just raptured? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Sorry>. Exactly. <laughs> and Brian and I are still on here. Yeah, Perfect. Right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah. So uh, you've done a lot of uh, work in Daniel, and and you say that Daniel is uh, an especially important for us in understanding Revelation. Can you explain a little bit? You know, I know you kind of alluded to that, but can you explain yeah. a little bit why, why that is the case that understanding Daniel is so important to understanding Revelation? Yeah, because Daniel's communicating essentially the same message to his contemporary audience, and his contemporary audience, well. Uh, I, I do take seriously a sixth century date of Daniel, which is yeah, highly debated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that in the sixth century, the Babylonians uh, under Nebuchadnezzar uh, began by bringing Jerusalem into vassal status. Uh, and eventually, after a series of revolts by Judean kings uh, in 586, destroys the city. Daniel himself is carted off into exile with the three friends in 605 BC, um, well before the final destruction. But the the point is that, again, uh, Daniel knows that his contemporaries, his faithful contemporaries, think that Nebuchadnezzar's in control, that Nebuchadnezzar right. is um, calling the shots, and uh, and he's writing to assure his contemporaries that, again, no, um, God's in control. Indeed, in the first two verses, it says something to the effect of God gave Jerusalem into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, you know? So it's kind of like the only reason why Nebuchadnezzar is successful is because God allowed this to happen. He's in control. And, Mm. um, and, and then the visions at the end are, um, saying um god is going to come again you know and he will win the final victory and right. will save his people and will judge those who are oppressing you and and that's the message which reverberates throughout the intertestamental time period and so it's kind of surprising even to a guy like john the baptist you know when jesus comes and he recognizes him that he's the one who's expected from the old testament but jesus goes out and baptizes people he um right. he he preaches the good news he uh you know he does he exercises demons and john the baptist sends up a couple of his disciples to jesus in matthew 11 and says are you the one or should we expect another in other words where's the <laughs> where's, where's the, the where's the where's the burning of the chaff where's the chopping of right. the rotten wood i talked about you know and and jesus basically in all that he does and says is saying yes but you don't understand my i'm coming not once but twice and twice okay yeah yeah. So, and I guess my question is, this kind of goes back to the, the question that Brian had, like, you know, some people are looking for these other meanings, but you know, my thing is, is, as I've taught through revelation is, you know, we've looked back at Daniel and if revelation's hard to understand and Daniel's hard to understand, <laughs> how does understanding Daniel, which is hard to understand, help us understand revelation, which is hard to understand. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like how, do the, yeah. how does that work together? Yeah. That's a great question. And it, means that we got to understand the imagery of Daniel within its Old Testament context. So in Daniel 7, right. for instance, it's not the first time that um, that evil uh, has been pictured as beasts that are associated with the sea, you know, or that. Right. And Israelites would understand that hybrid beasts were particularly repulsive and and on mm. and on. So this is already by the time of Daniel, um, well-known imagery for evil, or when the one like the Son of Man 
is writing a cloud, uh, that would have been already mentioned that God rides the cloud, and it would already be known from broader ancient Near Eastern imagery that cloud riding was associated with the warrior storm god. So, right. so the um, so it's so um, so the book of Daniel is utilizing imagery that was already understood within its contemporary culture. Right. So it's like we're often saying on here, you know, on, on this podcast, one of the things we constantly go back to is it's it's crucial mm -hmm. to understand the the history yeah. and the culture yeah. and right. the content that that context, the linguistic context, yeah, in order to understand these things. And so, yeah. yeah. So John, so, my buddy John Walton, uh, often will put it this way: it right. will remind us that the Bible wasn't written to us; it was written for us, but not to us. That right. every book of the Bible was written to a particular contemporary audience. Um, right. And you can see that just on the level of the language. It wasn't written to us. It was written in Hebrew sure. or Greek. And uh, right. Because I've had, I've had, I, I, I actually was lecturing once with John uh, Walton uh, on yeah. the creation text. And we were talking about ancient Near Eastern creation text and how it's helpful and illuminating to our understanding of uh, Old Testament creation text to know the Enuma Elish, Atrahasis. And somebody got up and said, um, we don't need you and your ancient Near Eastern historical background. All we need is our Bible. Oh, and right. I knew this guy didn't understand, didn't read Hebrew. And I said, really? I go, I had my Hebrew text <laughs> with me. He goes, well, go at it. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you actually... <laughs> I hope this didn't come across as too arrogant, but I said, right. actually, you need people like John and me to translate right. it. And do you realize when we translate the yeah. text, we're making tens of thousands of interpretive decisions. Decisions, yeah. But then I always follow yeah. that up by saying, but never forget that the important message of yeah. salvation is perfectly clear to everybody once mm, translated. Absolutely. You know, we yeah, might debate absolutely. over other things, but um, sure. Yeah, yeah that's that's one thing that Brian and I talk about. Like, it's you can spend your whole life yeah. studying scripture, but the gospel message is clear. But yeah. there's so much Very there clear. to keep yes. digging and digging absolutely. and digging into. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll say that's one of the things I've always appreciated about your writing and why I've used it in in the classroom and that kind of thing. Tripper is, uh, you know, you have a way you've you've clearly done your homework and you've you you do a good job of bringing scholarship to bear on the meaning of particular bible passages mm -hmm. but at the same time you're also very clear about the spiritual importance mm -hmm. the the importance for us as believers in in Jesus as you know it's not it, it, and you you'd bring them together in a beautiful way i think they're not mm -hmm. they're not uh, separated and so i i appreciate that we we've recommended and i know this this is a book that you wrote i guess probably 25 mm -hmm. years ago now uh, reading reading the Bible with heart and mind, which we've recommended on. This is one of the books that we recommend on this podcast, and I've recommended it for years. If you're someone who's just saying, "Oh, I, I kind of want to get a little bit deeper into Scripture," I say that's a great book to to begin with, and I think it'll really guide Thank you well. You. Thank so, you. Yeah. so I, I've appreciated that's a that's a like I said, we've we've made recommendations. I've used the I've used the quotation actually that for for probably over twenty years for with students about. Uh, uh, the the word of God is the single most uh, important thing for um, transforming our mm. lives. It ignites the character mm. of Christ within mm. us, is the way you said it. And I've I've quoted that probably every uh, year for the past twenty years. Well, thank you. Years. Thank so, well, I yeah, was a it's, student. It's a I don't great, remember it. Great book. Uh, but, <laughs> I don't. Yeah. But I don't remember Wait, much. Some, some students, you got to say it many, many times. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I'll I, be I, honest. I, I can. I'll, I'll claim that. I'll claim that. I, I was thinking about that earlier when you were. You know, it's an ideal student, like you were talking about an ideal yeah, reader. Yeah, it's like right, uh, you know, right. it's it. It's in the syllabus, right? Yeah, so, yeah, Brian, yeah. Brian's biting his tongue over there. <laughs> so uh, I have another question, Tripper. You use uh, in the book. You talk a lot about the structure of the oh, book yeah. of Revelation. You can come back, like, let's look at the structure. Let's look at the structure. So, what? You, tell us a little bit about that, and like, why? Um, how paying attention to the structure helps us understand the message as well on that. Yeah. So um, structure is always important. Whatever biblical book you're reading uh and it keeps us from simply proof texting bringing things out without paying attention to the broader literary 
context. So it's always important to pay attention to structure. Um, now, of course, the book begins uh, after an introduction with the seven letters mm -hmm. to the churches. And uh, sometimes we think the first part of the book are letters and then the rest of it are simply apocalyptic visions. But interestingly, the way the book of Revelation closes, it's very clear that the whole letter, the whole book is considered to be a letter, letter. to the churches. But I think probably the single most important thing to recognize is that as you get these various cycles of sevens, you know, yeah. seven seals, seven bulls, et cetera, that they're not consecutive things, that they are basically right. recapitulations of, of a description of the end times, which each case goes further and further into the end times. So um, rather than using that as kind of a way to build out a calendar of events that are going to happen right. at the end, I, I, I think they're simply ways of describing how Jesus is going to come again and um, and bring judgment on sinful humanity and rescue right. his faithful people. Right. That's very good. Yeah, we've we've discussed that. I mean, and, and you know, when I when I teach it, you get to that end of the first cycle and I and I ask students. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does this sound like? Doesn't this sound like yeah, the end of the right, world? Right, you know, right, right. Like... Let's do that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like every time, every time it's like, well, I don't know where we can go from here. But, you know, yeah. So if you read it chronologically, I think you get in a really difficult, you put yourself in a difficult position. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think I appreciate what you said. How would, I, I'm interested in your answer to this. Uh, how would you describe your interpretive approach or maybe kind of take us through some of the steps that you take when you're when you're approaching a text of scripture daniel or revelation or you know deuteronomy or whatever mark or matthew or whatever what? yeah um well i mean the first thing so i guess the best way to answer that question is to start with what am i trying to get at in my interpretation and right so and actually my present book project i'm finishing up a book on literary uh, literary approaches to biblical interpretation as part of a trilogy okay. for Baker that revisits a topic that I dealt with in the 80s where I wrote a book called Literary Approaches to Biblical Interpretation. Uh, so, so what we're trying to get at is the message of the author, okay? Now, as right. has been talked about, over the past few decades, it's impossible to get kind of into the mind of the author himself. Sure. But what we are right. doing, and it's been fascinating to me to revisit secular literary theory uh, over the past few years in a way that I hadn't done since the 80s, because in the 80s, everybody was talking about the death yeah. of the author. And it was a big yeah, deal. Yeah. Right. But now yeah. secular literary theorists are going, yeah, no, we really need to think about what the author's message is here. <laughs> wow. And it's uh, and and they're they're against these anti-intentionalist people, voices from huh. the past. Derrida is dead, by the way, according to some of these people. <laughs> but uh, not, not only literally, yeah, right, but also right, figured. Right. <laughs> and I won't speak to literally, but I think it's good <laughs> intellectually. Um, not that, I mean, I think postmodernism helped bring a dose of needful humility to modernism. But Right, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, um, so how do I do that, I want to put myself back in the position of the contemporary audience of the writer and right. try to understand the historical context, what that author's trying to address. Um, and so, so I think that's a really important factor. And then when right. it comes to, you know, most of my work has been in the Old Testament, where right. I advocate what I call a two-reading approach, that you read the Old Testament, first of all, in the context, in its contemporary Old Testament context. And then based on Luke 24, I think we're called upon to yeah. read it in the light of the fuller canon, the light of the coming of Christ. 
matter of fact, I laid this all out in my contribution to a Five Views book that Zonervan is bringing out this fall called Five Views okay. on Christ in, in the Old Testament. So, uh, huh. okay. so, um, but when it comes to the New Testament, of course, I still want to talk about it within its canonical context. But uh, right. especially with the book of Revelation, you're kind of at the sure. end of that canonical process. So you, right. you in the Old Testament, you, you, you read both forwards and backwards. Um, so, so at least that's my goal. That's, um, um, you know, that we could spend, of course, a whole course on the question of urban sure. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. No, I appreciate that. That's uh, I just was curious how you how you'd answer that question. Yeah, yeah. That sounds yeah, I, very very uh, makes makes a lot of yeah. sense. So uh, while you were researching this book, like, what were some of your favorite resources? Like, as you're yeah. kind of bouncing back and forth, because again, you know, we there's a mountains of resources, yeah. like you know, yeah. just everything. So, what were some of your favorites that kind of helped you? Yeah, uh, put, yeah. put this, some did. some of this together. Yeah. So I, um, well, that's another um, important point I'd like to bring out about how I approach it. Uh, what I try to do initially is not to refer to any other secondary sources. Right. Uh, and I encourage that with my seminary students, too. I say, don't read right. any commentaries until you think through right. the text yourself. But then after you do that, avail yourself of the thinking of other people, and uh, you'll find that your views are going to change on some things, or you may um, uh, disagree in the light of what you've been thinking. So I, I try to do that in my own research. So, um, but I did find, you know, say David De Silva, um, who first mm -hmm. wrote a book with Bruce Metzger, but then did some of his own work and yeah. updated Metzger's book on, um, on revelation. I found him very helpful. Yeah. Uh, also I think it's, uh, Williamson, a uh, Catholic scholar on on hmm. um, Revelation. Greg Beal uh, has done a lot of good work on sure. Revelation, though I particularly tried to avoid Greg's work when I first did it, just because I didn't <laughs> want to simply repeat everything he said. He, <laughs> he did a lot with, with the use yeah, of the Old Testament yeah, and Revelation. Absolutely. I mean, he did, really did. So, so, yeah. so I didn't want to yeah. uh, sort of spoil right. my own hopefully fresh right. but of course since we're both reading the same text we're going to have a lot of mm -hmm. similar ideas yeah. so but but and brian tab brian tab uh oh yeah did a, you did quote yeah, you quoted tab, him a lot and i was tab's I was... a younger scholar <laughs> of course okay. most scholars are younger than i am now <laughs> i'm turning 70 this year uh but it's really well, good to see um younger scholars who are um uh, producing really good stuff and and yeah. Brian Brian Tab has a really good sort of canonical sense about him and of course okay. he's pretty heavily influenced by Greg Beale too sure. um, so right. and I'm sure there are others I'm missing now yeah. oh, no that's good oh, I, Brian, I, I, I should what... mention my very good friend um, um, God. My very, very good friend. Uh, <laughs> What's his name? What's that his guy name? with the face. Grant, no, Grant Osborne. Grant Osborne. Oh, so Grant and yeah. I were, yeah. uh, are, I'm still, but of course Grant has died. Uh, Pens, we were one yeah. of the six scholars on the Senior Bible Translation Committee for the New Living Translation. So we New spent Living a lot of time yeah. together uh, talking yeah. about translation issues. And I, yeah. I, I do want to mention... Yeah. Grant's important work too. Yeah, very, yeah. very good author, yeah. and uh, yeah, good, just a good, good yeah. guy. Another, another yeah. guy that that took his faith, Absolutely. faith seriously as Absolutely. well. And, yeah. and uh, well, yeah. I, and I just want to say very I appreciate good. your book. So I've read some of the Beal and some of these other. I've read some Metzger and some Beal yeah. and stuff. Is um, Beal? You know, you, I've got the shorter commentary. Then there's yeah, the like right. the the, the, the shorter yeah. one that's six hundred <laughs> pages, and the long yeah. one that's twelve hundred. Yeah, um, but, yeah, you know, yeah. but uh, you know, uh, I, I really appreciate it. You know, you've, you're about. 325 pages here that you squeezed <laughs> it. I mean, it's a very readable, yeah. you know, like well, it's, thanks. it's it very is, accessible. Cause I think that's one of the things is yeah. you can get, you can go too far, you know, it's all academic and lost in the weeds or it's too remediary and no one can get yeah. into it. And I, and I appreciated those 
you really pointed out there's kind of the pause moment like let's look at the old testament here yeah, yeah, and see yeah, how yeah. this tied together yeah, so yeah um i i, yeah. I want, just want to let you know i, I really appreciated that, <laughs> that you. you know it's, it's you. a very accessible yeah. in, in that way that's um, what i was going i think for. it's good news. i was going yeah. for that <laughs> yeah well, good. I, and i have a question for you you know we're kind of going back to this hal Lindsay yeah. thing what yeah. was the moment like for you <laughs> when you realized wait Maybe this is different than what <laughs> I started with. You know, like what what was that development like for you as you kind of that's a good um, question. Yeah. Process yeah. Well, that, that personally. Well, I mean, first of all, remember I was introduced to Al Lindsay by a very attractive high school girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's right. I'll read it. <laughs> but uh but uh you know it it's but, and I was, uh, you know, new to the faith, brand new. Well, I was becoming a Christian. And so I right. wasn't exposed at that time to any kind of kind of formal thinking about how to read the Bible. But when I went off to college, I met the more beautiful okay. woman who I married. <laughs> and we're celebrating our 50th anniversary <laughs> next year. Um, Alice wow. uh, actually was the one who had become a Christian through a circle of students at Westminster Theological Seminary and introduced okay. me to Westminster and to uh, those students who included, for instance, a guy named Andrew Lincoln. He was a student at that time oh, who wrote yeah. the Ephesians yeah. commentary and sure. uh, and others. But um, but then I started learning a little bit about hermeneutics. R.C. Spool sure. would come to our campus in Ohio <laughs> and huh? talk right. about how to right. interpret the Bible. Well, not that I ended up I completely agreeing with R.C., but uh, <laughs> but he was a he was a great influence on us to get us right. to think, start thinking more reflectively about how to yeah. interpret the Bible. And good. Yeah. So it wasn't a rough transition. It wasn't like uh, it cast me okay. into a period of doubt. It was, uh, oh, yeah, I we need to take into account things like genre. <laughs> right. <laughs> I I uh, I was just imagining your your now wife giving you a copy of GB Care yeah, or right, something right. like that. Right. Exactly. You know, just, exactly. <laughs> instead of how Lindsay, you should really yeah, be, you reading should be reading this. Care. This is, this is much yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, anyway. back, back in the uh, day, me... by the way, I'll simply say there weren't a lot of resources available yeah. to us. It was, oh. uh, this would have been late 60s, yeah. early 70s. It was Francis Schaefer and Watchman Nee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was and pretty much of, it. In terms right. of Bible translation, it was the RSV or the King James Version in terms of a whole Bible. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah, 80, what, 80, yeah, late 70s for the in, the, the New Testament part yeah, of the NIV. Yeah, 84 so. for the whole Bible and 80, the whole thing, 81 yeah. for the NASB. Um, and, yeah, and, that's true. So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I just want to. We're almost we're almost out of time, but I want to just mention a couple of uh, the passages that I that you you helped me with. That I you know again I've taught through this, but I thought it was very helpful. Even in the early early part in the letters to the church is the the image of shameful nakedness. He will mm -hmm. give you clothing to cover your shameful nakedness. I don't know why, but I'd never I'd mm -hmm. never taken that back to to where you did with Genesis mm -hmm. three, and I thought that was just a really helpful you know, to, to connect it to the fall and the, and the effects of the fall. I really found that. And it just, it sparked all kinds mm. of thoughts. I thought that was a really good, that was a really good issue. Um, one that I agree with, I just wanted to mention is the, is this, the sea, the sea still is glass, oh, yeah. of course, is one of these images that everybody, but you know, you connect it with the laver, mm. uh, you know, there's lots of temple imagery. I'm, I'm big yeah, on temple yeah, imagery yeah. and of course, you know, Greg yeah. Neal is as well, but but uh, you're connecting that. I thought was really good too. But here, here's here's the one with a oh. question. That's just those are just things I'm like, oh yeah, those are those are good. Here's my question. I, I I'd never seen anybody do this. I loved it. And I, this is a question I get all the time uh, when I'm teaching the Book of Revelation. To, to, not, not the ones about the crazy stuff, but for people who are a little bit careful, more careful students, they'll say, why is Dan left out of this list of the twelve tribes when we get to the to the listing of the 
of the 144,000 and all this. And by the way, I agree exactly on your interpretation of the great multitude and the 144,000 and that. But, but what about what about Dan? And and I love the way so so the way you laid a, laid those uh, different lists. You show there's no there's mm. no one list in the Old Testament even that there it depends on the purpose uh, and and the context for which. But you you mentioned it just briefly. It was yeah. tantalizing. You have to remind me. <laughs> you know, here's kind of what I yeah, <laughs> yeah. What, you, what you said. Yeah. So what? Well, you, what you, you yeah. mentioned this, and I've heard it before. This idea that Dan is not there because of the association with the uh, the 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 yeah, northern right, um, right. Uh, shrine yeah. that was built by Jeroboam. But uh, is that yeah. is that what yeah. you you think that's yeah, the best understanding I, I of that? So. Or? Okay. I think so. I mean, right. I you know I do a lot. I haven't written a lot on the book of Judges, but I've done a lot of lecturing on right. Judges, and Dan is. Uh, portrayed in extremely yeah. negative terms there, not to speak of First yep. Kings 13 and the building of the altar there and sure. uh, Bethel and Dan, of course, yeah. but yeah. yeah. We just had one of our former students on, uh, who's now a professor of uh, Old Testament Semitic languages in uh, Trinity. at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, oh, yeah, Michelle right. Knight. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and and uh, she she's a, a judge's yeah, expert. So right. that's kind of her area of expertise. And and yeah, she was talking about Dan and the connection with the the last part of the yeah, book of Judges, right. and and just uh, yeah, how how all of that's kind of not the right, way it ought right. to be. You know, just really a, a big big mess. Yeah, I there, think so. I think people sometimes get put off if they try to find the good guy <laughs> in the book of judges. Hey, there, there aren't any good guys. Yeah. That was her, yeah. that was kind of yeah. her point that it's really, it's really saying this is what happens when we, you know, we, when we uh, leave God out yeah. of the equation and we try to yeah. do things and, on and our and own. Israel, it's just Israel didn't really, need outside influence yeah. to lose their way. Yeah, they, right, they do it themselves. Right. You know, yeah, like yeah, it wasn't yeah. just the outsiders yeah. that were casting away. Yep. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, Really appreciate you taking time with us, Tripper. It's been been fantastic. And again, we we really appreciate the book. I appreciate the the other things that you've you've written in the past. Uh, yeah, Ryan, so, you want to ask? But you you mentioned this yeah, one yeah, thing so, you're writing. Yeah. What so. what are you working on now? And oh, what, what's right. coming in the future? I mean, you've only written thirty. I mean, you know, <laughs> is that a career even? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what have you got covered? When when, when can we expect yeah, over yeah, forty? Yeah. You know, something like that. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, I actually don't know the exact number, but uh, but I know it's over thirty. <laughs> Might be thirty five. But, but who's um, counting? So I, noted. Besides smaller projects like the five U's and the uh, and I've done some things for uh -huh. various Cambridge Companion volumes and Oxford Handbook volumes, etc. That are coming out. I'm. I'm writing this trilogy for Baker, which Baker put it in different terms, but I understood it like I'm going to die soon. So could you please, <laughs> could you please put all that you know about the Old Testament as literature, the Old Testament as history, the Old Testament as theology in three volumes? I go, hmm. okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I'm working on the literature one now and trying to finish it up by this fall. And then I hope. Every two to three years after that, Lord willing, I'll finish the other two volumes. And uh, then um, I uh, got a call a couple of years ago from Zondervan. You know, Zondervan has recently published uh, Tom Wright and Mike Bird's The New Testament in Swirled. Yeah. And oh, they had already yeah. uh, recruited uh, have an Old Testament. Sandy Richter, yeah. who is my successor as the Robert Gundry okay. chair at Westmont, and uh, Nancy Erickson, who's an Old Testament person who works at Zondervan. And they asked me, would you like to be the token male? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> because, I said, because these are two wonderful Old Testament yeah. scholars. So I'm, I'm going to contribute to the future Old Testament in its world, which will be the counterpart to uh, Tom and Mike's New Testament in its world. So those are the big That's projects. Good. And then I think that'll take me, if Lord willing, to 26. And then uh, I'm, I'm going to try to do my best to resist signing any other contracts till I finish those and see where I am. And um, I have two former students, Pete Enns and Mark Boda, both 
well established, yeah. but uh, uh, I love them both. I don't always agree with them, particularly Pete, but uh, <laughs> but uh, they're on what I call senility watch. So they, <laughs> they're the well, ones who are okay. supposed to come up to All me right. and say, Tremper, put your pen down. <laughs> well, my question is, is there like a, a, an uh, like a not public bet between you and Tom Wright about who can write more books? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know who has that uh, down? Who? Uh, that John Golden Gay. No, John, yeah. John, yeah. I, we yeah. just, so I just took over the editorship of the uh, evangelical exegetical commentary of Logos. And, um, All right. and, and John's come out with two or three commentaries recently. And Dave Lamb, who's the Old Testament, new Old Testament commentary editor, was a student of John's. And John's been a longtime friend of mine, somebody I deeply respect. And we said, well, let's ask John to do Ezekiel, see what he says. And, and the amazing thing wasn't that he accepted, but within like a month, we had a sample that was excellent. So it's Holy like, cow. no, wow. John Goldgay beats both Tom and <laughs> and John John Walton's John Walton's pretty close and <laughs> yeah yeah but it's not a, yeah. it's not yeah, a, he it's, does. He, it's not a race and all the and right. those those friends produce such wonderful yeah things yeah, yeah. it's good it's good like you said there there was a time we didn't have right. just the embarrassment right. of exactly. riches we do now exactly. things yeah. that That's are available right. to us so, so Trevor how can well. someone get in touch with you are you do you have a blog are you on Facebook where where can we get in touch with you. Well, I'm on I'm on Facebook, um, and um, I have though the maximum five thousand friends, so I might not be able to. But I post sometimes controversial <laughs> things. I wrote a book called The Bible and the Ballot, so sometimes I go political on, <laughs> on the Facebook. And right. then, um, All right, uh, I used to have a website, but I let that slip. So the best way to find out about my books is simply like. Amazon, but I'm also open to people okay. who are interested in reaching out to me at longman at westmont.edu. Uh, if you ask me complicated okay. questions that I take me a long time to answer, <laughs> I probably can't do that. But <laughs> well, I, I tell you what, just point point yeah. to that's one right. of your books. Well, that's and right. say, yeah, just read that. Well, one, you, so. you're talking about posting stuff that was controversial. I, I watched one of your speeches and or you're giving a lecture somewhere and you said, I'm recently retired. I can say whatever I want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Excellent. Well thank you so very much for sharing your right. wisdom and you yeah, know the book so and, and giving us the time today. Well I want to thank you, Brian and Ryan, yeah. for giving me the opportunity. I really mean it. Thank you. Yeah, no yeah. problem. Thank you. Right. Anytime. Have a good one. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Ryan and Brian's Bible Bistro. Next week, Brian and I are back into Ephesians, wrapping up chapter three. Thanks again for joining us at the table. We will be back Tuesday.